Hello, I'm Troy Abels from Hanford, California, and you are listening to Gospel Tangents. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'd like to introduce Richard Turley. He's a fantastic historian and director of public affairs at the LDS Church. He's written a bunch of books, both on saints and sinners. So it's going to be a very fun conversation with him as we get to know him a little bit more. Now check out our conversation. I'd also like to remind you to please uh, send me an email to g at gospeltangents at gmail.com. You can send us a short liner saying, Hi, I'm you know Mary Johnson from New Hampshire, and Gospel Tangents is the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology, or something like that. So you can make it up, um, and we'll try to put you on uh, at the beginning of our next video. Now back to our conversation. Well, welcome to Gospel Tangents Podcast. I am super excited. I've got an awesome guest today. Could you go ahead and introduce yourself? My name is Richard E. Turley, Jr. I am the Managing Director of the Public Affairs Department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Well, yeah, and you're, that, that, for me, as a historian, you, you kind of undersold yourself there. <laughs> Do you want to start off? No, 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 go ahead. No, that's fine. So can you talk a little bit, because you've got some pretty awesome books out there. And can you tell us a little bit about some of the books you've written? Well, I've written or edited myself or with other co-authors and co-editors a, a number of books. I've written books on the history of Latter-day Saint scriptures, so how we got the Book of Mormon, how we got the Doctrine and Covenants. Mm -hmm. I've written with Brittany Chapman a series of compiled books on women's history called Women of Faith in the Latter Days. Mm -hmm. I've done a couple of children's books with Lael Litke. One is Stories from the Life of Joseph Smith, and the other one deals with Brigham Young and the First Pioneers. I've done several books on the Mount Meadows Massacre, four that are out already and one that I'm finishing up right now. Mm -hmm. And on it goes. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're excited uh, to talk a little bit about the Mount Meadows Massacre. Thank you. Um, I talked to Barbara a few weeks ago, so uh, we talked a lot about kind of the events that led up to the massacre. Mm -hmm. And I know with your new book coming out, I'd, I'd like to see what we can uh, pry out of you on, on, on the, <laughs> the sneaky stuff or the stuff coming up. So okay. um, that, that's great. Now, there's another thing. A few months ago, um, I was at the, the launch party um, for a book called Saints. Do you want to hold that up and sure. show people? And tell us a little bit about that book. You, you had a lot to do with that one as well. So Saints, the story of the Church of Jesus Christ in the latter days, is the first multi-volume history of the church produced officially since B.H. Roberts' Comprehensive History, which was compiled from a series of journal articles that he wrote and published as a set in 1930s, part of the church's centennial. Saints is a four-volume work that breaks the history of the church up into four time periods, 1815 to 1846, and then from there until 1893, and then from there until the mid-50s, 1950s, and then from that point to the present day. And it, it is a history that is written in narrative style. So it, unlike a lot of histories which are just somewhat expository, this one's narrative, which means it's deliberately intended to be engaging to the reader. The content is is extraordinarily accurate history that's been source checked repeatedly and you can find the sources in the in the back of the book but it's also written in a very engaging style so it it has already become by a, perhaps an order of magnitude the single most read history in the history of the church well and it's sold out too do you know that <laughs> we 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 give it away electronically <laughs> uh -huh. and we've had a vast number of downloads We've also had a vast number of chapter views, so we know that we have over a million people reading it mm -hmm. right now. Well, I tried to get it for my mom for Christmas, and it was sold out. And I was like, are you kidding me? Well, it, it's, a re <laughs> it's a remarkable, volume one is remarkable, and the other volumes will appear in succession. Mm -hmm. I encourage everyone to read it. So there's going to be four volumes total. There'll be right? four volumes, yes. Do you know when the next one is planning to come out? Or? I think we'll probably see, the, I mean, I'm... I can't officially announce it, but right. if, if I were to guess, I think we'd see them one a year. One a year? Okay. Well, that's pretty cool. So, so yeah, that, that's, that's really exciting. Have you gotten a lot of feedback as far as um, people who liked it or didn't like it? You know, you know, there's always critics out there. Sure. We've had an awful lot of feedback, and the, the single largest kind of feedback that I've gotten personally is how much people love it. Mm -hmm. They love it because it's a book... That, it's a history that can actually engage them and pull them through. Mm -hmm. A lot of historians joke that their 
works are not read by very many people. I heard a historian joke once that uh, when his mother passed away, now he can only sell three copies, one to himself, one to each of his parents. <laughs> this particular volume is meant to be read. Mm -hmm. And so we not only had historians who were engaged in the writing of it to make sure it was historically accurate, we had some very fine writers who we engaged to, to help cast it in a form that it would be engaging to the readers. Mm -hmm. And it's a team project. By the time we get to all the translations and so forth, we probably had 900 people involved in the production of the volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a fun read so far. So thank you. Well, great. Well, let's move on to some of your other books. Um, and I I I have three of your books on Mountain Meadows. Um, in fact, these are the two most recent ones. That I, if that's yes, correct. that's correct. Can you tell us a little bit about those? So when when we were writing, my co-authors and I were writing Massacre at Mountain Meadows. Mm -hmm. We gathered a lot of information. In fact, we. We ended up with more than 50 linear feet of files that we had collected from 31 states in the United States and the District of Columbia. Multiple, well, we, we, that, I include in that the National Archives in, on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., the National Archives in Maryland, what we sometimes call Archives too, and the uh, Denver facility for the National Archives. So we had a lot of information, and the information that we gathered included historical documents, the legal documents. And the legal documents were particularly important because no one had ever really examined the case from that perspective before. And I, having a legal background, was particularly interested in doing that. So working with uh, Janice Johnson and LaJean Purcell Carruth, who is a shorthand transcriber, we mm -hmm. put together these two volumes. And then a uh, an associated website that has on it thousands of additional pages of information. And these these volumes give you the perspective from a legal standpoint of the Mountain Meadows uh, case, mm -hmm. including information related to the nine people who were formerly indicted for the massacre. Okay. Well, and one of the things, I remember I went to your book signing, uh, Benchmark Books, mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I remember LeJean said was, that the court records weren't actually accurate. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Typically, historians who have written about the Mountain Meadows Massacre have relied upon two transcriptions, one called, that we call the Borman transcript. Mm -hmm. And the Borman transcript is a transcript that was prepared for the judge in the case, Jacob Borman, who thought at one point that he'd write a book. So this transcript was created uh, years after the trial itself mm -hmm. for the use of the judge. And unfortunately, the, in the process of putting the, together the transcript, the, the person who had taken the initial shorthand was not available. So Borman hired an associate of that person to come in and try to transcribe shorthand. Now, if you've ever taken any type of, of shorthand yourself or tried to work with shorthand or if you've, if you've tried to uh, read somebody else's uh, class notes, for example, you know how difficult that can be. And so it was very difficult for this shorthand transcriber to really understand what was being transcribed. And so there were challenges with that. And then in addition to that, uh, this Adam Patterson, who tried to transcribe, um, who, who took the original shorthand and then had it transcribed by one of his students, you also had Josiah Rogerson, who was a reporter reporting, we think, for the church, and he had his own shorthand. So the, the transcripts that are normally called the Patterson shorthand and the Rogerson shorthand have major omissions. They have differences from the actual shorthand itself. So what we tried to do is we tried to go find all of the original shorthand that we could and then have LeGene transcribe it and then compare those transcriptions to the 19th century transcripts with all of their omissions and changes. Mm -hmm. And so between these two volumes and especially in the online help, we are able to show you all of the variations so that you can look at them and evaluate for yourself what you think really happened in the trials. Yeah. Well, that, that's really cool. So, you know, I know one of the and I, <laughs> one of the interesting things, a couple of interesting things. When I talked to Barbara, one of the things that she said was she learned more about Mountain Meadows from the trial than than she ever expected. Um, number two, you know, we've got Will Bagley, and he'll, he, he's more of a, a critic of the church. 
and he's going to say, well, how can you trust anything that, that uh, anything that put out by the church? And certainly you work for the church, as you mentioned earlier, in public affairs. How would you respond to somebody like Will on that point? I think everybody has to go back to the original sources, and that was our point in all the research we were doing for our books. We tried to peel back all the layers of the onion to get to the core. Mm-hmm. As I mentioned, a lot of historians have written about the Mountain Meadows Massacre and have relied upon the transcripts that we now know to be uh, not complete and also to be erroneous. So what we've provided for the public, anybody in the public who wants to see it, is access to not only the the commonly available transcriptions, but also a wholly new transcription that relies on the shorthand itself. Okay. So we've been able to peel the, the onion back to the core. Wow. And so what's the what's that website? Uh, mm-hmm. If you look at mountainmeadowsmassacre.org, okay. and it features all of the, the, the works that we've done on Mountain Meadows, and then there's a portion on there for all of these transcripts. Mm-hmm. Well, so that's really interesting. So you, you did mention you have a, a, a legal background. Can you tell us a little bit about your schooling and, sure. and, and that sort of thing? So I got a degree in English, and that's helped me over the years in writing things. The, the idea of doing a narrative history, for example, came from my English background. I knew oh, if we wow. wanted people to read it. In fact, uh, in an early meeting with our team that was putting together Saints, I I said something that was meant to be semi-ironic. I said, we are going to do something extraordinary. We're going to write a history that people are actually going to want to read. (laughs) And that's proven to be the case because Mm -hmm. we deliberately chose a narrative style that tells a very accurate historical story. Okay. As far as my legal background, I I went to law school at BYU, Mm -hmm. graduated and went to work for a Chicago-based law firm that had a Salt Lake office. While I was in law school, I took criminal law and criminal procedure, which are required of all first-year law students, and and was at the top of my class in both of those. So I I do have a fundamental understanding of criminal law, which is necessary for, and criminal procedure, which is necessary for evaluating all of the legal documents associated with the Mountain Meadows. Okay. Did you, so when you worked as a lawyer did you do did you try a lot of cases or I did not you did no not? in fact I practiced law for a very short period of time okay the church just grabbed you right away is that what happened, That's what, happened. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do as a as a lawyer when you in that short time so during that short time I worked mostly on finance mm-hmm. law so real estate finance um, municipal bond issues things like that mm, that doesn't sound very interesting well it's probably not interesting to the general public, but it's a, a very important practice. Yeah, and I'm sure it's probably lucrative as well for those, those, you know, those types of lawyers. Well, that's awesome. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Richard Turley. In our next conversation, we'll talk about the conflict between the Fancher Party and the Southern Utahns. What was the conflict about? We know the Fanchers wanted to buy supplies, but what were the people in Cedar City upset with the Fanchers for? In those days, many cities in the United States, including uh, cities in Utah, had anti-profanity ordinances. If somebody profaned uh, in public, you could arrest them and then either imprison them or give them a fine. Isaac Haight, before the company arrived, said, we're going to try to get some cattle from these people. Why get cattle? Well, in the event of a siege, they'd have food that they could use to help supply themselves. So if these people were expressing themselves verbally, they could have used their Anti-profanity ordinance is a way of arresting these people and then taking cattle from them as a fine. We'll have a transcript out shortly on this conversation. And you can purchase individual copies at our website at gospeltangents.com shop. If you want to be the first to get a copy, please subscribe on our website for just $10 a month. I'll send it to you first as a PDF. Or if you'd like a physical copy for $15 a month, I'll be happy to send that to you as well. You can get our transcripts at our Amazon.com author page. I've got a link here, but just do a search for Gospel Tangents Interview and you should be able to find a bunch of them there. Please subscribe at Patreon.com slash Gospel Tangents. For $5 a month, you can hear the entire interview uncut. And for $10, you can get a PDF copy. We've also got a $15 tier where if you want a physical copy, I'll be the first to send it to you. So please subscribe at Patreon or on our website at GospelTangents.com as well. For our latest updates, please like our page at facebook.com slash gospel tangents. And also check our Twitter updates at, at gospel tangents as well. Please subscribe on our Apple Podcast page at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents. Or you can subscribe on your Android device. Uh, just do a search for gospel tangents. Thanks again for listening. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript. And over here we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again.